Hi, I'm Mike from SourdoughHome.com and BakeWithMike.com. For the past two and a half days, we've been, well, let me rephrase that. After two and a half days, we tried to make some bread, and I managed to mangle the loaf as I put it into the um, Dutch oven. So I started a new starter so I could again make bread with a two and a half day old starter. And, as we say, I muffed it. I got the timing wrong. The first 22 hour block is crucial, and I cut that short by four hours. Okay, that's on me. So I started making a starter again, and then our air conditioning went out, and I somehow lost all desire to bake with our air conditioning out. The house is in the high 80s to low 90s, so I just put it on the back burner. We've got air conditioning again. Life is worth living. I made the starter again, we're ready to make the bread. Of course, nothing goes smoothly, as you can tell from the previous narration. I run out of rye flour, and in this part of the country, getting rye flour means either a long drive or mail order. So I changed the recipe, we're just doing a straight white bread this time. That said, we're ready to use the uh, starter. Uh, the starter looks nice and bubbly, not as bubbly as I would like, but on the other hand, it's only two and a half days old. It will continue to develop. It will continue to develop in strength and flavor by using it. So, we need 170 grams of starter. To that we're adding um, 550 grams of water. To that we're adding 860 grams of flour. And 17 grams of salt. At this point, you can use a fork, you can use your hand, if you have a Danish or Amish dough hook, you can use that. Basically, we just want to stir this enough that it all comes together and all the flour is wet. We're going to use a stretch and fold technique, so we really don't want to develop the dough very much at this point. All we're trying to do is get the flour wet. Then we'll cover it, let it rest for half an hour, and start doing stretches and folds. At this point, it's pretty much together, and the fork's not being really effective. So I'm going to use my hands just to get all of the flour wet. Now, this is a 68% hydration dough which is a little bit drier than a lot of people make, but it makes a very nice sandwich bread. It is in line with where San Francisco sourdough bread typically is. This isn't a true San Francisco style sour bread, but it's similar. But again, this is a very simple bread. No auto lease, just sourdough, flour, salt, and water. In the end, that's all you really need. You can make it fancier, you can do more wonderful things, but you don't have to. And here it is. It's shaggy, it's ragged, it's uh, totally undeveloped, and that's where we want it. So I'll get the gunk off my hands, cover it, and let it rest for 30 minutes. Well, it's been half an hour, the dough's been resting, and now it's time to see what happens. Now, I like to have wet hands when I handle dough, so I've got a little water here. Dough doesn't stick nearly as much if your hands are wet. The 
there are a million ways to do stretching folds. This is one of them, and this is one I like to do the first time I do a bread, especially a light bread. I reach under the dough, stretch it out. We've been doing this since, gosh, 2006, 2007. Okay, well, the reason I like to do this, at least the first time I stretch and fold, is because I want to look for flour that hasn't been absorbed or incorporated into the dough. Clumps of raw flour in your bread are very unpleasant. The French call this a frissage. I call it mashing it with the heel of my hand. Call it what you will. As you can see, very little stuck to my hands because my hands were wet. Yeah, there's some more. I look and I feel for the dry flour. Once I'm sure it's been taken care of, I fold the dough down. Kind of like a letter. I'm going to check this for clumps of dough also, or clumps of flour rather. Then I'll fold up from the bottom. Checking again for dry flour. Then I fold it in from the sides. Checking again for clumps of dry dough. Okay, we're going to put it back in the mixing bowl. Let it rest for another half hour and then do the next stretch and fold. Well, it's been another half hour and here we are looking at our dough. It's considerably more smooth and looking a lot better than it did last time. We're going to try a different form of stretch and fold this time. It works quite well with uh, more watery or looser doughs and not so well with stiff doughs. I'm not sure where this one's going to fall. First, using wet hands and a wet scraper, we're going to loosen the dough from our mixing bowl. And then pick it up. It's called a coil fold. Basically, you just pick it up and let gravity stretch it. I'm going to put it on the work surface here. Drop it down, let it fold. Get more dough stuck in here. Turn it 90 degrees and repeat. Turn it 90 degrees and repeat. As you can see, it's firming up and stretching less with each of the stretching folds we're doing, or coil folds as they're called. So now back into the bowl. We'll pick up some stray dough here. Put it back with the loaf. Now we're going to cover it, let it rest for half an hour, and then we'll do our third and final stretching fold. Well, here we are again. It's time for our third stretch and fold. After the third stretch and fold and a half hour rest, we'll see if it will give us a good window pane. If it gives us a nice window pane after the half hour rest, we'll begin the rest of the process. If it doesn't give us a good window pane, then we'll give it another stretch and fold and another rest. Usually the third or fourth time we get a good window pane. So we'll use our dough scraper to loosen the dough from the bowl. And do another coil fold. I like the way the coil fold worked last time. The dough is getting much stronger, it's not stretching as much, and that's a good thing. Somebody needs to oil this cutting board. Turn it 90 degrees again. Turn another 90 degrees in the last coil fold. And back into the mixing bowl. Scrape up the stray dough to join its mother dough. And as you can see, it's coming along quite nicely. We'll give it another half hour and see where we are. Okay, we have done three stretch and folds on the dough. And there's a chance it's ready for the rest of bread making. 
I like to deal with dough with one hand, so we'll start there. And basically, I want to see if this dough will just stretch out nicely without tearing, and it's a very small tear. I think we're pretty much good. So what we're going to do is move the dough to a fermentation container. Press it down with the wet hand and cover it. I like containers like this because they're sealable and because they're calibrated. Uh, I want to see if how much the dough has risen. I want the dough to rise between 25 and 50 percent. Right now we're at about a liter and a half of dough. When it gets to about a liter and three quarters, two liters, we'll be ready to go. If you let the dough overrise, you don't get as good an oven spring later. I'd like a good oven spring. I used to let the dough double in size and got a little oven spring. Now I'm getting more oven spring and I'm happier. So let's let this rise until we're ready to, ready to deal with it. Okay, this has been sitting here for about an hour and a half and it has risen about 25%. It was about here, now it's about here. It's got some nice bubbles on top, so we're ready to move forward. Now, I like to damage the dough as little as possible so I'm not reaching in and grabbing it. I'm tilting the container and letting gravity do the work. Come on, little buddy. And there we go. Uh, what we're going to do now is scale the dough to the right size for the loaves we're going to make, pre-shake them, let them rest a little bit, then shake them and put them into rising containers. So, First one we're looking for is 770 grams, and then two to 390. Five grams over, not too bad. We'll just divide it evenly. Okay. I'm using the tension of the wood and the scraper to pre-shape the dough into a blob. I'm going in at around a 45 degree angle. Yeah. Having a somewhat wet scraper helps. Pre-shaping the dough makes it easier to do the final shaping. 
Every time you handle the dough, the gluten tenses up and becomes more resistant to movement such as shaping. By doing pre-shaping and then letting the dough relax, it's easier to go into the final shape. We'll let this dough sit about 10 minutes and then we'll do the final shaping. Well, it's been about 10 minutes. The dough has probably relaxed a bit. And it's time to make some loaves. I know it's not sexy or fashionable, but I do like a pan loaf. So we're going to put one loaf into the bread pan. I sprayed it with uh, Baker's Joy, which is a mixture of oil and flour. There are similar products from a company called Baker's Secret. I think Pam makes one now also. So, let's see what we can do. Get this shape up. Very sticky dough today. Very, very sticky dough today, which is kind of unusual. Okay. Because it's so sticky, I'm just blobbing it into the pan, and the rise will take care of the irregularities. Cover the shower cap, move it aside. We've been playing with different rising containers lately. This is an inexpensive basket filled with a uh, hairnet. And I just sprinkled a bunch of uh, rice flour on it to hopefully help keep it from sticking. I've been oiling the cutting board Well, we haven't been filming, but evidently not enough. Okay. That one's in. And now the other new container. Lovely darling wife bought me this just because she thought it looked cool and there was a great deal on Amazon for it. This with a lamb and other odds and ends was seven dollars, which I thought was just amazing. With a liner, you have trouble finding and bannertons like this without liners for seven dollars. Okay, this is enough. I'm going to cheat a bit and dust the dough with rice flour also. And then put it in the banneton with the seam side up. If you have a tight dough with the seam is fairly tight, you can put it seam side up. If you have a loose seam which is falling open, you put it seam side down so gravity and the management will hold it shut. And now, these are going into the cooler until tomorrow. They'll rise in the cooler until tomorrow. Hi, I'm Mike from SourdoughHome.com and BakeWithMike.com and today we're finally going to bake the bread that we've been working towards for the past two and a half or three days. I put this in the cooler overnight to rise and unfortunately life got in the way and instead of being baked the next day it's been about two days. We had errands to run, places to go, people to see, things to do. And now we're finally ready to get back. That's one of the nice things about putting the dough into a um, wine cooler is that your time frame is 
considerably looser than it otherwise would be. Okay, so. Oh good, it came off. <laughs> We've had the dough stick to the nuts we're using. Let's give it a slash and another slash. Now we'll put it into the oven. The oven's at 425 degrees, which is probably around 240 centigrade. I'll put the correct temperature in the show notes. Yeah. I like a wet razor blade, so I'm keeping it in the uh, glass of water I have here. And now this one goes into the oven too. Many bakers say loaf breads aren't artisanal. They aren't artisan breads, but really, the baker is the artisan, not the bread. And however you bake it, if you're an artisan, the bread is an artisan loaf. Many people like a sandwich loaf because they can cut it into slices and make nice sandwiches. So we're baking a batch of this as a uh, sandwich loaf. I'll slash it. One of the things I've learned is if uh, your dough collapses, when you slash it, that's a hint that it was overrisen, and you shouldn't slash the rest of the loaves in that batch. So this is going into the oven also. I like to put a bit of water in. I have a disposable pie pan in the bottom of the oven to keep the bottom of the oven from rusting. And there we go. Now we steam the oven, about two cups of water. And we'll wait about 25 minutes and see what happens. Well, I guess that means the first part of the bake is over. Most ovens, most home ovens, don't bake very evenly. So I like to move things around in the oven to try and even things out. A little thing from front to back, left to right, and top to bottom. Let's see how it goes. And then we'll give it another 20 minutes. And at this point, the water is pretty much out of the bowl, so we're done steaming. We'll give it another 20 minutes. Yeah, 25 minutes. There we go. And then we'll see how the bread looks. Well, the timer, I think, is time to check on the bread. So let's check on the bread. There are many ways to tell if a loaf of bread is done. One is to thump it and see if it sounds hollow. That's never worked for Jeffrey Jeffrey Hamelman taught him. He was appalled that people would stick a loaf of bread with a thermometer because it ruins it. He just said thumping it was fine. And he thumped the bottom and it sounded hollow. Of course, he's a master baker. And to quiet us, he then stuck a thermometer in it to check the temperature. I like my bread done to 205 or more. This went to 209 degrees. The only thing I had problems with in the long run was I'd stick the thermometer in the middle of the loaf of bread, slice the loaf of bread to take a picture of the crumb, and there would be the hole that the thermometer left. When we were baking professionally, we check one loaf of bread on the theory the rest would be at the same temperature. 
and then we cut up that loaf of bread to be samples so nobody got a loaf of bread with holes in it. Okay. Let's see what these guys say. And then when it cools off, we'll slice into them and see what the crumb looks like. These are small loaves, but they started out as small loaves. Okay, come on. 210 degrees. I like anything above 205. So I think we're good. I didn't knock on these to see if they sounded hollow. These do. So I think we're good. We'll check them in a little bit. Slice them. See what the crumb looks like. Do a taste test. But they have definitely risen. And uh, the two and a half day starter has done well. Whether I did a good job on these loaves of bread, that's another question. But I think it is. And now the grand reveal. We're finally going to slice the bread we've been working on for about the past three days. Uh, let's cut them in half. At this point, we're not doing any kind of affiliate marketing, so this is just a testimonial from the heart. I wasn't happy with my bread knives, so we bought a really nice bread knife, and then my wife bought one of these, which is a Rada bread knife, which is about $11. I like it better than the really nice bread knife. We'd had one before and lost it in a move, but it goes through the bread very nicely without compressing the crumb. The only thing I would like to improve is the handle. Okay, we've got a nice, fairly open crumb and the small loaf. Smells good, a little bit sour. There's some talk about grilled cheese sandwiches for lunch, so let's slice some of the sandwich loaf. And a knife is only as good as the person who wields it. Not quite as open a crumb, but that's to be expected of a sandwich loaf. Nice crisp crust. Slightly sour smell. Tears nicely. It'll definitely do. Very nice taste. A little sour. The wheat comes through. Good balance. A nice crust. I love the heel of the bread. Some people hate the heel. Some people love the heel. I love the heel. Well, that's it for this time. I think our two and a half day experiment is a success. The starter has been growing and developing since uh, I made this bread. I've been feeding it and it's bubbling much more nicely than it did when we made this bread. So like I said, any starter, after you get it going, continues to develop at least 30, perhaps for as many as 90 days. So, there we go.